This episode goes out to our patron, Hank Green. Don't ever forget to be awesome. Hi there, Garrett Robinson here. Welcome to the second episode of the Nightblade Epic Podcast Season 4. Hey listener, we're going to get into the show pretty quickly here, but before we do, I just wanted to remind you about the Underrealm Full Hardcover Collection, which now includes Tales of the Wanderer Volume 1. That brings the collection to 12 full novels and 11 short stories set in the world of Underrealm. It's over a million words for a huge discount over buying the individual books. It's the best way to dive into this fantasy world. To order your collection today, go to underrealm.net slash books. That's underrealm.net slash books. Also, if you can, please support this show on Patreon. This show is possible because of the incredible support we receive from our community and nowhere is that more true than our Patreon supporters. To support the show for just a dollar a month, or more than a dollar a month, go to underrealm.net slash Patreon. That's underrealm.net slash Patreon. Okay, now it's time for today's episode. Today, you're getting chapters 2 and 3 of Shadeborn, the fourth book in the Nightblade epic. When we left off, Lauren had set off into the woods with Chet to escape the angry eyes of the wizard Zane. Enjoy! Shadeborn, Chapter 2 The crisp air of morning did much to clear her head, and she drank it in with a long breath. If she was honest with herself, it felt better to walk with Chet than to sit at her table and drink, but sometimes facing the wine was easier. Dawn's thin gray light was just creeping into the sky from the east, and Northwood had begun to stir into wakefulness. She heard the sharp hiss of a smith's forge firing up, and the first tentative squalls of cocks greeting the day. But they met few faces upon the streets, and for that Lauren was grateful. It let them walk to the northern gate with few curious eyes to see them. She no longer held much fear that her many enemies had followed her here, and yet the fewer people who saw them within Northwood, the better. A single guard sat at a table by the open gate. She was well accustomed to seeing Chet and Lauren take their walks, and gave them only a cursory glance before turning back to the game of moons that lay before her. Soon Lauren and Chet found themselves among the trees of the forest they had once called home. A few steps farther still, and Northwood had vanished behind them, blocked from view by the trunks. Now Lauren felt herself truly relax, as though the last cobwebs had been swept from the edges of her mind. Here within the wood, her eyes saw things differently. Bent blades of grass told her of the passing of a deer, and when she heard a skittering within a bush, she knew it at once for the rustling of a vole. The forest was altogether different from the world of men, and she had greatly missed it since she left. It was all the more enjoyable because she knew Chet saw it just as she did. Sometimes they would speak as they walked, other times, as now, they walked in silence and let their feet carry them where they would. They found a narrow brook, making its eager way to join the Melnar to the south. In silent agreement, they turned to find a crossing upstream. Soon they came upon one, a place where the banks rose high above the surface of the water and drew together, close enough for a long jump to carry them across. Just as they reached the other side, the sun peaked its face above the branches of the eastern trees, and all the birds of the birchwood burst into song together. Soon they found themselves in a clearing some thirty paces across, with a great stone in the middle like a tombstone. There they sat, their backs against the rock, its cool surface chilling them after the eager pace of their walk. Chief among the reasons Lauren enjoyed their walks was that Chet seemed content with silence, or with speech, as Lauren wished. 
he would converse with her eagerly, answering questions about what had happened in their village since he left. From him she had learned of her mother, who had vanished without a trace the same day Lauren had. Lauren had some half-remembered notion of family in one of the northern outland kingdoms, and assumed her mother had gone to find them. Two, Chet had told her that sometime after his mother passed away, his father had begun to court Miss Aisley. Lauren thought that a fine pairing, though Chet himself seemed unsure just what to think of it. But when Lauren wished for silence, silence was what Chet gave her. Now he simply looked with her into the trees, his hands toying with a stick he had snatched from the ground. Together they reveled in a quiet comfort. And without any pressure to speak, Lauren found her tongue moved more freely of its own accord. In the city of Wellmont, I was caught trying to steal a man's purse, she began. Chet glanced at her and smirked. I thought you were a great thief. Is that a lie for you to be so easily caught? I was not easily caught, said Lauren, shoving his shoulder. I was betrayed by my own kindness. I saw the man beating his son and thought to relieve him of his coin, but then at the last moment I thought the child might relish a lie free from his father. That was a mistake. The moment I made the offer, he told his father of my words, and the father called the constables. A foolish boy, said Chet lightly. He could have gone with you and been pitched headlong into mortal danger, but at least you would not have beaten him. Mayup, said Lauren quietly. She had not meant to turn the conversation towards a father and his child, for that subject reminded her too closely of things she would rather not think of. But in any case, the constables brought us to their quarters within the city, and there, to his shock as well as mine, I found Jordell inside. I will remember the surprise on his face, and the anger, forever. Chet grew quiet, as he always did when her words turned to Jordell. Chet had never met the mystic, something Lauren desperately regretted. It seemed a crime that anyone should not have known the man, as great as he was, as quiet and heartfelt his praise, and as cold and terrible his wrath. She doubted she would meet his like ever again. What surprised me then, though it should not have, was how quickly Jordel guessed at what was going on. As soon as he heard that I had been caught stealing from the woodsmen, his eyes grew sharp with suspicion. With barely a glance, he seemed to know the whole tale, and he was as merciless with the father as the father was with the son. And though his anger with me remained, it softened and turned more to annoyance, as though he thought I was right to do as I did, though his duty meant he could not say so. Her voice drew dangerously close to a tremble. One tear leaked from her eye, so she leaned her cheek on her fine black cloak where it draped over her arm, to soak up the drop and hide it. Once more, the clearing was silent, save for the morning birdsong. She spoke again into the stillness, forcing her voice to remain steady. Where did they find my father? Chet glanced at her from the corner of his eye and then looked away again. It is no tale for a day so beautiful. Likely it is too ugly for any day that may come to pass. Tell me then, and let its darkness fade away once and for all. You have seen too much evil of late. I would not bring more upon you, not at least until you are ready. When I tell you this tale, I wish to tell it only once, and in full, so that we need never speak of it again. Then tell it now, said Lauren. Chet sighed. Then he pushed himself from the rock and sidled over to sit in front of her, his eyes fixed on hers, though she turned her gaze away. His corpse was a league south of the village when we found it. He lay on his belly, his head turned to the side, eyes open and staring. There was no blood in his spittle, but it had frothed greatly and gathered around his lips. Lauren swallowed hard. She knew what would come next, the tale of his wound, the one that had slowly bled him out beneath the trees of the same forest in which they now sat. Chet watched her, gauging her reaction. She kept her face as still as she could. We could see at once that he had bled to death, 
Though the fletching had broken from the arrow, the shaft still stuck from his thigh. It had struck a vein or nicked it as he crawled, and all his lifeblood had drained out. The trail of it stretched far away south, may up half a league more. When we followed it, we found at the end the signs of a struggle, between him and, I guessed, you, but also a third person who we did not know. I hazarded another guess that it was the wizard the constables sought. You were right in that, said Lauren, glad her voice had remained steady. That was Zane. My father nearly strangled the life from him. He would have, if you had not stopped him, said Chet quietly. And he might have killed you, too. Lauren remembered the fight as though it were happening again. She saw the spite that filled her father's eyes, the spittle that flew from his lips with each hateful word. And now she imagined him crawling north after the fight, the shaft protruding from his flesh, his life pouring into the dirt beneath him. She saw him shuddering and convulsing as he died at last, and wondered if he had spent his last words cursing her, his own flesh and blood, whom he had never given anything so wasteful as love. "'Likely my words cannot help you,' said Chet. "'But you should not blame yourself. You restrained your hand beyond all reason. You might have planted your arrow in his eye or his heart. You did not. You tried to show mercy.' And Mayup, if he had stayed where he was, he would not have died in the end. But Lauren knew better. She remembered when she would chop her father's logs for him, how he would come and threaten her so that she would work faster. And she remembered how he would take her into the woods and beat her, his thick and meaty fists leaving bruises beneath her clothing that would last for weeks. And she remembered going back to chopping his logs, and gripping the axe tightly in her hands, and picturing it lodged in his skull or in his back. Her breath came faster as her thoughts raced on. Images flashed through her mind's eye, the corpse and the arrow, and the axe and the corpse and the spittle and the blood and the corpse and the corpse again. And then the corpse became Jordel's, and she saw his twisted body upon the floor of the valley that lay between the arms of the great rocks. She fought the urge to vomit and rolled to her hands and knees. Lauren, cried Chet. He knelt by her side and placed a hand on her shoulder. Lauren pushed him off, breathing faster until stars danced in her vision and her head spun. She tried lifting her gaze to look upon the sky, but she could see only blackness where there should have been blue. Black and blue, like my bruises. She screamed and slammed a fist into the earth and then struck again and again. Her fist flew into the boulder and she felt the skin of her knuckles break. The pain gave her focus and she clutched her hand to her chest. At last she could sit back without her gorge rising. Rage turned to hot, bitter tears that left their trails of grief upon her cheeks. Chet sat beside her with one arm around her shoulder and his other hand cradling her mangled one. It was not your fault, he kept murmuring. It was not your fault. Soon she felt in control again, and as she had so often, she took her rage and her grief and hid them away, deep inside herself where no one else could see. At last she looked up at Chet and tried to smile, but she feared she only looked sick, for his look of concern deepened. I am all right, she said softly. I am all right. Come. The children will have risen, and they are likely driving the others mad. She rose shakily to her feet, shrugging off Chet's helping hand. Together they set off into the trees, walking slowly now. But Lauren no longer saw the green of the leaves, nor the crystal clarity of the brook as they crossed it. She saw only black and blue, and the red of blood. Shadeborn, Chapter 3 Jem had been an urchin child when Lauren found him on the streets of Cabras, hungry and picking pockets in the service of a guild of young thieves. Annis had been a daughter of wealth and plenty, her every whim tended to by the comforts her mother's coin had afforded. Their circumstances could scarce have been more different, yet they had surprised Lauren equally since their arrival in Northwood 
for both of them had spent every spare moment helping Mag around the inn. From tending to the stables to running drinks and meals to visitors when the common room grew busy, they took eagerly to even the meanest task. Neither had been raised in a life of honest work, and yet they took their roles as Mag's helpers very seriously. They seemed to enjoy Northwood greatly. Lauren told herself that one reason she had lingered so long was to give them a rest, which they greatly deserved. Even to her own ears, though, that excuse sounded thin and flimsy. "'With the cook's compliments,' said Jem, arriving at the table with a tray, upon which he had balanced five bowls of stew. "'And the ladies,' said Annis, swooping in with another tray that held five mugs of ale and two loaves of bread. "'Our blessings upon the cook and the lady,' said Alburn, scooping up his bowl and his mug. He tucked in with great abandon, tearing the heel from one of the loaves and dipping it into the stew. The sun was nearing the horizon, and many within the town had joined the inn's tenants for supper and a drink. The common room buzzed heavily with talk and occasional bursts of laughter. Lauren could hear the plucking of strings from somewhere in the back of the room as some minstrel readied to earn his dinner. But still her mind lingered on dark thoughts, and though her stomach growled at the smell of the stew, it tasted bland as paper upon her tongue. Chet tried valiantly not to show his concern, but Lauren could feel it emanating from him like the glow of a torch. None of you will be surprised, I am sure, to learn that I have spent another day proving my worth said Jem brightly as he ate. The first spoonful of stew did nothing to slow his words, and the food mashed noisily between his teeth as he talked around it. Today I cleaned the hooves of all the horses in the stable, and laid fresh hay for each steed. Then I found that the dishes had stacked into a mighty mountain, and so I cleaned them all, every one, without even having to be asked. I hardly know how this place managed before I arrived. Oh, they must have pined for a dishwasher like yourself, Master Urchin, said Alburn with a smirk. Poor Mag must have spent her nights crying herself to sleep for want of such noble scrubbing hands as yours. Just so, said Jem, missing the humor in the bowyer's tone. Annis sniffed primly and dipped just the end of her loaf into the stew, nibbling on it with perfect manners. Well, while you have been getting yourself filthy down here, I have been striving for cleanliness. I cannot guess when the rooms upstairs were cleaned last, and some of them stank of something which I am sure I would not like to know about. But they are clean now, and I have only knees and hands worn to the bone to show for it. Give me a few more days here, and I am sure I shall make the place fit for the custom of the High King herself, though why she should find herself in such a town as this I am sure I do not know. Jem blinked and looked uneasily at Lauren. "'But surely we will not be here that long,' he said slowly. "'I thought we would be leaving any day now.' Lauren could see, or rather feel, Zane's irritation from the other side of the table. She held her peace, excusing her silence with a mouth full of food, which she chewed slowly so as not to be obligated to answer. Alburn caught her unease, and likely Zane's dark look as well, for he shrugged and said lightly, you shall all set forth when you are ready. There is no great rush. Certainly Mag enjoys your company. But she cannot enjoy the food we eat, nor the wine we drink, nor the rooms we sleep in, without so much as a copper penny taken in exchange, said Chet. Despite his words, he took a deep pull on his mug of ale before continuing. I do not understand why she will not take our coin. It gives her pleasure to give you comfort, said Alburn. Do not ask about it again, or she might bring her spear from its retirement, and then you would be doomed. I can handle myself, Chet muttered. Not against Mag, I promise you, said Alburn. Years might have passed since she wielded a blade, yet I would wager all my coin upon her if she were to fight anyone in all the nine lands. You would, too, if you were wise. When we were young, she was called the Uncut Lady, and renowned as the greatest fighter in our company. And when she hung up her shield, every mercenary captain across the land poured a cup of wine into the dirt, Chet finished. You have said that before. 
And do you doubt the truth of it? said Mag. She had emerged from the common room's crowd to stand over the table. At the sound of her voice, Jem and Annis both turned to her with delighted smiles. But she fixed them with a stern look and gestured at the table. Where is my plate? Where are my mug and my chair? Surely the two of you know better courtesy than this. The children's faces fell. Jem scuttled off towards the kitchen while Annis ran to fetch an empty chair. They were few and far between in the crowded room. Finally, she found a drunkard slumped unconscious on a table and tipped him unceremoniously from his seat. Our apologies, Mag, said Annis as she pushed the chair up to the table. We thought you were busy in the kitchen and did not guess you would sup with us tonight. Sten finally rustled his useless hide out from the stables and came to relieve me, said Mag. Tonight my company is yours, if you will have it. We will, and gladly, said Jem, who had returned with a bowl and a mug for her. These he set down with great reverence, as though he were serving a king. And mayup you can settle a matter over which I have spent much thought. None of us doubt Alburn's words when he calls you the greatest fighter he has ever known. But how can that be when you look no mightier than most of the people in this room? Why, your arms are not even so thick as his. If you think me a weakling, mayhap you will wrestle me and see how long it takes me to pitch you into the dirt, said Mag, arching an eyebrow. Jem stammered and stuttered and finally fell silent, looking down into his lap. Alburn laughed out loud. Come, Mag, leave the boy alone. He has never seen you dance. You cannot blame him for wondering when he has only seen the sort of fighting you get from common street thugs and city guards. He leaned over to speak conspiratorially to Jem as though he were confiding a great secret. Not in the strength of the arm, little master, but more often in skill will you find the greater warrior. What use an opponent's brawny bulk when their blade cannot come close to our mag? The most dangerous fighters are the ones who dance with their foe like a lover and who can stay on their feet and swinging long after the other man is ready to vomit his guts into the dirt. Surely you have seen the truth of that, said Lauren with a half-hearted smile. If all things in life depended on strength alone, you and I would have died in a ditch long ago. Alburn shook a finger at her and nodded. Just so. Why, once Mag and I and the company were fighting in the kingdom of Kalinton, putting down the insurrection of some upstart who thought he could seize the throne because he had a flock of pretty knights at his back. One of these dullards came riding down on Mag with Lance lowered, but she... The crash of a fist on the table threw them all into silence. Zane had slammed his hand down and held it there now, his gaze roving across their faces. Lauren's heart went to her throat as she remembered his madness in the mountains, when he had cast thunder and flame upon them with abandon, stricken with the magestone hunger just as he was now. Without thinking of it, she moved her hand to the hilt of the dagger beneath her cloak. From the corner of her eye she saw Alburn's hand steal beneath the table, likely to his own weapon. Around them the common room had grown quiet. If I must listen to one more of your tales, I will fling myself into the Melnar and drown, Zane growled. He shot to his feet and, seeing Alburn tense, held up a hand. Stay yourself, Bowyer. I need only the girl. Lauren, you have avoided this for too long. Come with me now, or do not expect to see me darken this inn's doorway again. If you are determined to sit here and pity yourself until the Nine Lands fall, then I will carry on with our task alone. With that, he stalked between the tables and out of the inn. A few of the people he passed by gave Mag a doubtful look, but she shook her head gently, and they let him pass. Something gnaws at that man, she muttered when Zane had gone. You speak more truly than you know, said Lauren quietly. Chet leaned over to murmur in her ear, You need not go if you do not wish it. Inside, Lauren was fuming. Zane spoke to her as though she were some child, whimpering in the corner because she wanted second helpings at supper. He had been there in the mountains when Jordel had fallen, 
Then he had wept as openly as the rest of them. If his mood had darkened since, and if his cravings for maidstone scratched at the edges of his mind, he had no one to blame but himself. How dare he mock Lauren's pain, speaking as if she had forgotten her duty? But she only shrugged. He speaks at least some truth. I should have had words with him days ago. If it will stay this foul temper that has seized him, I will have them now. I can go with you, said Alburn. No, said Lauren quickly. Stay. Tell the children your story. Surely they will enjoy it. And she rose to follow the wizard into the city. This has been a production of Legacy Books, written and narrated by Garrett Robinson. The music in this podcast was created by Will Musser. Check out his incredible work at willmusser.com. That's W-I-L-L-M-U-S-S-E-R dot com. Today's letter is E. Thank you for listening. Bye-bye.